Good morning. Good morning. You'll notice a different service this morning. We do have a guest, but we also do not have a piano player. So we're going to have fun this morning worshiping our Lord. So why don't you stand this morning? As we start out with Amazing Grace, my chains are gone. Coming in the night 
You have to go ahead and find your seats. Go ahead and find your seats and we'll continue our worship this today. As you can tell, we've kind of having a little bit of a change up around today since Pastor's not here. Uh, he is out in, I believe it's Holland. Is where they're at? Yep, Holland, because Joy is graduating from college. So we wish Joy all the best. And uh, we hope they have a safe trip uh, there and back and a fun time with Joy. So as we uh, prepare now, let's go ahead and, and uh, take our prayer to the Lord and, and uh, prepare for offerings. So if those who would uh, be helping with offering, if they uh, get ready. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this glorious day that you've given us, uh, this wonderful spring weather that uh, we've been enjoying. And 
Lord, we know that it's only through the, the blessings of your hand that we receive these benefits, uh, both sun and rain. And we, we thank you for those, Lord. And we return to you, Lord, a small token of what we have. Um, but it's not just a token, Lord. It's do you. It is yours. And we ask that you take it and multiply it for your purposes. In your name we pray. Amen.
blood, it is my victory. Amen. Let's consider these, uh, these words from the writer to the Hebrews. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but the body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here am I. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. Please stand and join us if you're able. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. We pour out our 
our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness. You give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our Morning. Uh, this morning we have uh, our guest speaker is Dr. Richmond Fleshman. Uh, currently, he's the director of field education at the Charles Feinberg Center for Messianic Jewish Studies. Uh, interestingly, I ran across a, a book a week ago about the incomplete church, and we did a brief study on that and. Bible school this morning, 9.30. What it means by incomplete church, Jesus' church is essentially, is, uh, some uh, in the scripture it refers to two rivers or a couple, two branches of the same tree, same roots, Jesus' roots. I think as uh, we, we just kind of think of ourselves as a uh, Christian church, but we don't realize as uh, the Gentile Christians and the Christian uh, Jewish, the Jewish Christians. Uh, and we don't remember them. We don't think we're part of it. We're all part of the same church. It's not that we're Jews, we're Gentiles, and we're Gentile Christians, and there's the uh, Jewish Christians. And when we get a full understanding of that, and when they come together, uh, we're going to see great things happen in this world. And then, uh, Dr. Flashman will be uh, giving a little bit of background on, on himself and, and what his, uh, how he's utilizing the gifts that God has given him.
mentioned, I'll leave the chairman off for now. All right, I'm, I'm going to be speaking a little bit before. I'll get that a little bit later. Um, I work uh, for Chosen People Ministries, uh, which has been, been around about 125 years. Uh, one of the oldest Jewish missions in, in, in the country. Uh, and uh, was started by Rabbi Leopold Cohen uh, back in 1894. Rabbi Cohen was a, uh, was a uh, Hungarian Jewish rabbi uh, and in Hungary. And uh, he read the prophecy in Daniel chapter 9. And, and you know what he said? He said, the Messiah must have already come. Because if you read carefully Daniel chapter 9, you realize that Messiah has to come before the second temple is destroyed. Well, the second temple was destroyed what year? Anybody know? 70 AD by the Romans. In 70 AD, the second temple was destroyed. So Messiah had to come before 70 AD, according. And so Rabbi Cohen said, where's the Messiah? Well, one of his friends said, well, if the Messiah is anywhere, he must be in America, because in America, the streets are paved with gold, right? So, uh, so, so, he, so he, he dragged his family and everything, moved to, moved to New York, and was in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, walking through and saw, and saw a Yiddish gospel mission. He walked in, heard the gospel for the first time in Yiddish, and, and, and knew it was true and gave his life to Jesus. And started the, the Brownsville Mission, uh, which became the American Board of Missions to the Jews, which in the mid-80s became Chosen People Ministries. So, uh, so that's, that's a little bit of the background of Chosen People Ministries. Um, I was a happy evangelical free church. Oh, go. Oh. Sorry. Good. Better? Yeah. Okay. Could you hear me before that? Yeah. You bet you could. <laughs> uh, but I was a happy evangelical free church pastor. I, I, was, uh, I went to Trinity, uh, did, did uh, two degrees at Trinity, and, and ended up uh, pastoring two churches in um, uh, uh, Connecticut, North, Northeast Connecticut and Southwest Connecticut, one for f first for five years, second one for 22 years. And then, but I made the mistake of inviting Mitch Glazer, the president of Chosen People Ministries, to our church to speak at our church, like I'm speaking at your church. And, uh, and, and he took me out for lunch afterwards and asked me if I'd join the mission. I said no, and uh, here I am. You know, uh, and it took about six years, but, but I, I got the word from the Lord that this is what he wanted me to do. And I I'm, I'm love doing it. I love, I love what I'm doing. I, I am a, a professor of, of practical theology at our seminary in, in Brooklyn. Uh, and anybody know Biola University or, or Talbot School of Theology? Is that familiar to all anybody? Okay, that's on the West Coast. Uh, Talbot's about, uh, uh, Biola's about 7,000 students. Big, big school in the West. We're, we're uh, the, the Graduate School of Theology. We're their East Coast extension. Uh, and it's called the Charles Feinberg Center for Messianic Jewish Studies. Um, and uh, and so, so I've been... Uh, I've been a pastor for 27 years. I've been a missionary for over, over oh, almost three and a half years now. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit new to me, but uh, I love it. I love what I'm doing. And, and, uh, but how did I get here? I had a nice Jewish boy from Newton, Massachusetts uh, get to a place like this. You know, and and uh, that, that's the question. Uh, I grew up in a, um, in a loving, uh, close-knit uh, Jewish home uh, in Newton, Massachusetts. We're Reformed Jews. Uh, you guys know the difference between the Jewish people, uh, the difference between Reformed Jews, conservative Jews, Orthodox Jews? Okay, so, so uh, I'll give you a little, little breakdown. Um, uh, the, uh, you take all of Jewry, but there are about 14 million Jews in the world. Um, about 38% about of those Jews are unaffiliated. They, they don't belong to any kind of synagogue. Uh, they're, they're just basically secular, secular people with, with a Jewish identity. Strong Jewish identity, uh, but, they don't, but they, don't, they, don't, they don't exercise any religious uh, aspect to that identity. Uh, maybe, maybe they'll celebrate Passover at home or something like that. Uh, the, the next group is called the Reform Jewish Movement, which started in, in the, late, uh, the mid to late 1800s in, in Germany. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm from that movement, uh, the Reform Jewish Movement. Uh, and it, it's, a, it's a movement based on human reason. It's like, it's like being a liberal Christian. You know, you, you, it's not based on the revelation of God's word. It's based on human reason. You know, and, and so they, it, but with a Jewish twist to it. Uh, and so I grew up, I, grew up, uh, I was bar mitzvahed and, and uh, confirmed uh, in the synagogue uh, in, um, in Boston. Uh, Temple Israel in Boston, and uh, and that's an interesting story in itself. And then and then uh, and then uh, and that's a Reformed Jewish synagogue. Then there are the conservative. So about 35 percent of Jewish people are 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 uh, Reformed, and then about 17 percent are conservative. Conservative Jews are Jews that, that are outwardly look like anybody else, and, and, and just sort of in, in the secular world. But when they get together and they worship, they worship in a more traditional fashion. Okay, and so and so it's a more traditional style of worship and so forth. But but in, in their in their in their out-of-synagogue experience, they're very much like the rest of the culture. 
Uh, and then finally, you have, you have the, uh, the Orthodox Jews. Orthodox Jews are the people that um, walk around with big, maybe big hats, you know, or, or a yarmulke on, and, and uh, they, uh, they, they, keep the, they try to keep the hall. They keep kosher. They, they eat only kosher food. They keep the Sabbath. Uh, they, uh, they're, they're strict in their observance, depending on what, what, which, which element of the, of the Orthodox community they're from. Um, is there a Jewish community around here? You guys have a Jewish community in the, in, in anywhere around here? No? What's that? Lansing. Probably in Lansing. Yeah, well, it, well, that's what Michigan State is, right? Is that, yeah. Okay. So you, you're definitely going to have a Jewish community there. Whatever there's, whatever there's a, you know, a big university, you're going to find a Jewish community. Um, so, uh, but not, not around here, not where, where you guys live. Does anybody have a Jewish doctor, a Jewish lawyer, a Jewish accountant, a Jewish, you know, uh, you know in, in, in one? <laughs> You know, yeah, you, you, you may, you're a Jewish professional in your life, something like that, an acquaintance, somebody you work with maybe, you know, um, and anyway, so that's, so that's, so that Orthodox Jews are about 10% of the Jewish population. Now, they, they're, 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 there are two kinds of Orthodox Jews, there's modern Orthodox and there's ultra-Orthodox, that, that sort of break, break, breaks off a little bit. Modern Orthodox will, 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 inter, will have intercourse in the secular culture, whereas ultra-Orthodox separate themselves almost fully from the culture. They don't even want their kids learning English. They want them just, just to speak Yiddish. Uh, they send their kids, they send their kids to, to um, uh, uh, yeshivas, y uh, y Yiddish-speaking schools, and, uh, and, and teach them the Talmud. Anybody know what the Talmud is? The, uh, the, the, the Talmud is to Jewish people what the New Testament is to us. Okay, it, it explains the Torah to them. Uh, I'll, I'll get into that a little, a little bit later. Okay, anyway, so I grew up in this Reformed Jewish home, pretty liberal, you know, uh, I was, I was, my, 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 my father was a materialist. Um, yeah, he believed when you're dead, you're dead. Six feet under, that's it. There's nothing beyond the grave. Uh, that, 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 that's where he, my, my, my mother came from an Orthodox Jewish home in Atlanta, Georgia. And she was a, what I would be called a God-fearer. You know, she, she wasn't practicing anymore, you know, but, but, but she feared God. I think, I think, I think you can honestly say that about her. Um, but anyways, I grew up in this home, and, and my, but my orientation was mostly secular. You know, I grew up during Vietnam and uh, Watergate and all the, all the tumultuous times. Any boomers here? We got some baby boomers here who grew up during that time. You know what I'm talking about, right? You know, uh, probably up in East Lansing, it was crazy up there, I'm, I'm sure, you know, uh, during that time. And I, so I, I had a lot of questions about why the world was the way it was. Why was there so much inhumanity? Why was there so much uh, greed and avarice and hatred and bitterness in, in the world? I wanted to know why. You know, maybe you, maybe you didn't. I did. You know, some people, some people uh, were struck at an early age about these things. I was, you know, and I, I, I sort of carried that with me sort of silently in the back of my mind for, for many, many years and just sort of lived a normal uh, Newton Jewish life and ended up at the University of uh, Massachusetts. And there, uh, I, I came with some of those questions that I had uh, about why the world was the way it was. And the professors at the, at, at the university said that it was because society was corrupt. If we change society, we can change people and make the world a better place. And because uh, man is a social being. He's, 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 he is uh, shaped by his social environment. So, uh, so I bought into that. And I, was, I was a theoretical Marxist for about three years. I ended up doing a political internship for Ted Kennedy in Washington, D.C. I was to the left of Kennedy. You know, uh, you know, you know, Kennedy was like a big liberal senator. I was to the left of Kennedy. He was the establishment. And I worked for him in, in his office in D.C. for about six months in 1977. And, uh, and it was an it was, it was interesting experience because I came away from that experience realizing that what I believed couldn't possibly be true. I, because of what, I, what I saw in Washington, D.C. was the corruption of man. And it wasn't society, it was people that were, that were, that were corrupting. And I, I knew that the problem wasn't in the social structures, the problem was in, was in people's hearts. The problem was in my heart. And, uh, and I realized that. So I went back to the university. I had one more year to go. I go back to the university, and, and I, I remember thinking to myself, you know, uh, that, that my philosophy was dead now, and I started taking business courses to make up for my ideal, I, I, my, uh, my I, 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 ideal, idolatry? <laughs> I, 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 my idealism. And, uh, and I remember thinking to myself, if there's no God, there's no hope. Because man's, we can't save ourselves. You know, and I realized that. And, and, and so... And that thought led me to remember I, 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 an incident that happened earlier in my, in my college years. And I was a freshman in college. A young man knocked on my door in the, in the dormitories. I opened my door and he said, Hi, my name is Paul. I'd like to talk to you about establishing a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm Jewish. He goes, that's okay, so is he. And I, and I, said, I said, that's true. You know, and uh, I, I invited uh, Paul to come, come on in. 
And Paul shared the gospel with me. He said that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. And, and, I, and I said to him, I said, why do you think that? He goes, it's, it's an historical fact. I said, where's your historical data? He said, the Bible. I said, come on, the Bible, oral tradition, human writing. He goes, no, the Bible is an historical document. Read it. Well, I wasn't interested at the time. Uh, that was my freshman year. Uh, he wrote me a couple letters. It challenged me to read C.S. Lewis and the Hebrew prophets. You know, at the time I wasn't interested, but now, in my senior year, I'm, I'm, I'm remembering this. And, uh, and I, I began a search for God, and I started reading the Hebrew prophets. And I came across the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. Um, now, I was told in, in, uh, in the synagogue that, because I, I went to my rabbi one time, and I, and I, I said to my rabbi, you know, he, he, was, he, was, he was describing God in one of his classes, uh, the uh, class that we had. And I didn't recognize the God he was describing. So, uh, so I followed him into his office afterwards. I said, Rabbi, you were talking about God today in class. I didn't recognize the God you were talking about. And he goes, well, I don't believe in a personal God. And, and, I, and I, said, uh, I said, what kind of a God do you believe in? I, I believe God's an impersonal force. I said, okay. I said, what about Messiah? And he goes, I don't believe in a personal Messiah either. I said, well, I said, well, well the, the Gentiles think that, uh, that Jesus is the Messiah. You know, and he goes, well, he couldn't be the Messiah. And I said, why? He said, because when Messiah comes, he's going to bring peace. And since Jesus has come and there's no peace, he can't be the Messiah. Made sense to me. For seven years, I didn't ask any more questions about Jesus. You know, uh, because there's no peace in the world. But when I came across the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, I read that. And what I said to, what I said to myself as I read it was, what's Jesus doing in my Bible? Because this, this, this is this passage of scripture perfectly depicts the ministry of Jesus. I knew about the ministry of Jesus. I went to a private school as a kid and I had to read about the life of Jesus. And so I knew what he did. And I said, this depicts his life. And this was written 700 years before he was born. I said, how could that be? I said, he, and, and so for the first time in my life, I said, he could be the Messiah. You know, and, and the Holy Spirit just got a hold of that. Once I said that to myself, the Spirit of God just rammed that. It went from he could be the Messiah to he might be the Messiah to he's possibly the Messiah to he could be to the, to he's probably the Messiah to he's the Messiah. About two or three months, I was, I was intellectually, I believe that he was the Messiah. Isaiah 53 had a powerful impact uh, on my life. Uh, it, really, it really shaped me. I, 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 uh, I came to that place. Now, I was, I, I was a secret believer uh, at, at the time because I, because I was scared to death to tell anybody. You know, that, that, uh, that, I was believe, that I was believing that Jesus was the Messiah because, because I don't know if you heard, Jews don't believe in Jesus, right? Have you heard that? <laughs> yeah, we don't believe in Jesus. And so I knew that I would be ostracized by my community, my family, my friends, the Jewish community. All my friends were Jewish. You know, all, 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 family, all my family's Jewish. They, they, they knew that, that, that I would be ostracized if, if I came out and said I believed in Jesus. So for a year, I was, I was a secret believer uh, you know, um, and, uh, and, you know, sort of growing in the faith a little bit, and listening to Christian radio and reading the Bible, you know, and, and, but, but be, keeping it secret. Until April 30th, 1980, I was working, I was working two, a couple of jobs. I was, I was starting a business, and, and I was also working for a kosher caterer. And it was a Wednesday night on April 30th, 1980, and I was uh, working a donor dinner for, um, for, a, uh, uh, for a Temple Sinai in Marblehead, Massachusetts. And I was asked if I would, if I would stick around and, pull, and pack up the truck while everybody else could go home. And I, and I said, sure. And everybody else went home. And I waited for the ladies to finish, fin finish their dinner. You know, and, and I'm outside, and I'm hearing them praying uh, on, on, the, on the inside of, the, uh, of, of the, the, the synagogue. And I started thinking about God and Jesus again. And I'm sort of walking around the synagogue parking lot. To make a long story short, I had a vision. Jesus showed up in a vision. And, uh, and, uh, it was, and it changed my life. And I knew, I knew I had to uh, surrender my life to him. And so I, I, said, I, said to, I said to the Lord, I said, okay, Lord, I'll do anything except the ministry. <laughs> and, then, and then I said, and then when he called me to ministry, I said, okay, Lord, you called me to ministry, anything but New York City. <laughs> I, said, I, w I wish I had said anything but Hawaii. You know, <laughs> I, I could be there now, you know, and enjoy it. You know. But if you, really, you really want to be what God wants you to be. <laughs> that's, that's the bottom line. So, so Isaiah 53 had a, a huge impact in my life. Uh, it, it's, it's a critically important passage. And I want to read it uh, for, for a moment and, uh, and, and, and ex explain it a little bit. Um,
So if you have your Bible, you turn to the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. Actually, we'll start with, we'll start with Isaiah 52. Um, verse 13. 52, 13. That's really the beginning of, of this pericope, of this, of this section. Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were appalled at you, his appearance was disfigured more than any man. His form more than the sons of men. So he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what, he, for what had not been told them, they will see. And what they had not heard, they will perceive. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nor beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. One from whom people hid their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our pains. Yet we esteemed him stricken, struck by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our transgressions. He was crushed because of our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. So the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, like a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Because of oppression and judgment, he was taken away. As for his generation, who considered? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, the stroke was theirs. His grave was given with the wicked and by a rich man in his death, though he had done no violence. Nor was, there any, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, to cause him to suffer. If he makes his soul a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and he will prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will succeed in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied by his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, will make many righteous and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will give him a portion with the great, and he will divide the spoils with the mighty, because he poured out his soul to death and was counted with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Has anybody not read that before? Have you never, never, have, have you, have you never read that before? Never, never read that before. What do you think when you read that? Powerful, isn't it? This was written 700 years before the ministry of Jesus. It's amazing. I mean, I mean I, if, if anybody asks you, or anybody asks me, why I believe the scriptures are true, I go right here. I, I, I go right to Isaiah 53. I said, how in the world could, could the, the prophet, 700 years before the event, have predicted it so precisely? It's one of the most, one of the most amazing passages of scripture, really a, a, a centerpiece of, 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 our, of our faith in our experience. You really, you really don't need, I mean, adding Jesus' name to this passage wouldn't really add much more to it, would it? it it's so evident. It's so obviously Jesus from the passage. Now, when you re read this to Jewish people, you know, that is essentially what you have going for you, um, you know, is, is, that, is that this is a powerful passage to share with Jewish people. Um, most, you know, the problem is, is that most modern Jews uh, you know, don't, don't believe in biblical authority. Uh, they, they, they don't think that the Bible is, is necessarily true at all. They, they remember, remember they, they base their, under, their, uh, their authority is reason, not revelation, not the, not the word of God. It's their own human reason. Um, and again, like, like liberal Christianity. Um, and, and so about 90% of Jews, you know, if you, you know the, one of the problems you have to overcome you know, is you know, a, a low view of the scripture, a low view of, of what that is. Now, there are, there, the Orthodox Jews uh, have been indoctrinated against believing that this is Jesus. Uh, they, 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 these, these are the Jews that are highly trained, 
or at least trained in Talmud, I should say. But, but they deal with this issue in the Orthodox Jewish community, and, and, they, and they're indoctrinated not to, not to see Jesus uh, in this passage. Now, that's interesting because and really until the 11th or 12th century AD, this was always interpreted by the rabbis as messianic, or, uh, like 99.9% .9 of the time. It was, it was interpreted as being a messianic passage about, about Messiah. Um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 one of the problems, again, is, is, that, is that the whole, the whole issue of sacrifice, we're very familiar with that in the Christian church, right? We understand that Jesus is a sacrifice for our sins. Jews, uh, rabbinical Judaism moved far away from the sacrificial system. Remember, it's, remember 70 AD when the temple was destroyed? Well, they, how, do you, how do you be a Jew without a, 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 a temple? Okay, the temple was the center of Jewish life. That's where they brought their sacrifices for their sins, right? We, we, we know all about that because we studied the Bible. We studied the Old Testament, right? And we read all about the sacrifices. But, but in, in 70 AD, the temple's gone. So the rabbis got together and said, now what do we do? How do we, how do, how do we remain Jews? How do we practice our Judaism you know, without a temple, you know, with, without a place to bring the sacrifices? So they, they studied this issue and talked about this issue for hundreds of years and came up with a, uh, you know, I shouldn't say, it came, up, it came up soon with a new way of atoning for sin, all right, uh, based on repentance and, and uh, prayer and fasting and uh, good deeds, which the Jews call mitzvot, okay? So if you do good deeds, you repent, you pray and you fast, you can atone for your sin. Now, that's nowhere in the Bible. You can't find that in the Bible. In fact, I was on the streets of New York one time and a, and a Jewish guy came up to me, he wanted to talk to me and and, uh, and so I looked at him and I said to him, how do you atone for your sin? You know, and, and he looked at me and goes, I repent. And I, and I said, repentance is good? I said, it's a good thing? I said, but show me in, in Torah or Tanakh, that is the five books of Moses or the rest of the Bible. The, the, the word Tanakh is the word for the, what we call the Old Testament. And so I said, show me in Tanakh where it says that repentance atones for sin. He looks at me and says, you should keep the law. You know, it doesn't answer my question, right? You, you should keep the law. And I, and I said, have you heard about the new covenant that God has made with Israel? It's in, Isaiah, it's in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, where, 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 where he's made a new covenant and, and that, that the law has been replaced by, by mercy and grace. You know, and, and, he, and he said, people like you should be executed. You know, that, that's, that's welcome to Brooklyn. You know, that's the way it is there. Um, but the, the, the point is, is, that, is that he believes that he could atone for a sin through through repentance and through good deeds. And it's, not, it's nowhere taught in Scripture that you can do that. So they, they developed this new religion, this what I call rabbinicalism, okay? And, and uh, again, and they wrote and they gathered all their writings and they put it into a book called the Talmud, all right, which has two parts, the Mishnah and the Gemara. The Mishnah is a commentary on, on, the, on the Old Testament, uh, mostly the, uh, Moses, and then the Gemara is a commentary on the Mishnah. Uh, the Mishnah was finished in 210 A.D. The Gemara was finished in 499 A.D. Uh, and so the, that, those two books make up the Talmud. And, and that's their book. That's the Orthodox Jewish book. That's, that's sort of their, their understanding of the Bible comes through those books. Uh, and uh, they be, even become more important than the Bible itself uh, be, because it, you can't understand the Bible properly unless it's through the Talmud. That's the way they think. So, so you have to deal with that, and so you have to deal with a religion, a bloodless religion. Now, that, 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 and so you're talking about sacrifice, and like it says in Isaiah 53, all, this, this, this substitutionary sacrifice that's all over the pages, and it's strange to Jewish ears, because, because Jews don't, don't think like that. You know, I was at a, a bar mitzvah one time, and I heard a man talking to the rabbi, and the, the, this, the Torah portion was all about Levitical sacrifices. And he said to the rabbi, he said, Rabbi, what's all this stuff about sacrifices and blood? What's that all about? It's, it would be strange to a Jew to hear that because, the, the, it, it, because there's nothing like that in their religion. Their, their religion is keeping the law. That, it's, it's, a, it's a very legalistic-based religion these days. Jews think that, that they're Jewish, and, that, and that, that, that means something. There's something special about that, and so... They think there's some special standing with that, but they also know at least uh, that, that they should be keeping the law uh, of, of Moses. And, and so there's that struggle that goes on, uh, that goes on between lot, uh, themselves, how much of the law they're keeping. You know, remember that the, the, the rich young ruler came up to Jesus? 
Remember what he said to him? Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to live in the age to come? You know, uh, you know and, and Jesus said, well, have you kept the commandments? And he goes, oh, yes, yeah, since my youth. He goes, well, you like, only lack one thing. You know, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, come and follow me. You know, and he went away sad, right? But, but he wanted to know. He wanted to, what must I do, 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 to inherit eternal life? That's the way the Orthodox think. And I work in Orthodox Jewish Brooklyn, it's the most, most Orthodox communities in the world. Uh, there, by the way, Brooklyn is a, is a town, uh, of a city of three, 3.2 million people, about a million Jewish people. Most of them are very serious Jews. Uh, about a third of them are ultra-Orthodox Jews. Those are the Jews with the big hats and the payas down the side, the, big, the sideburns and the big beards and, you know, and, and the davening, you know, and, and you know, seen them at the Wailing Wall and so forth. You know, and uh, these are very serious people, very serious Jews, and very insular as well. Their communities are very tight, and, and uh, they, they are, they're told not to talk to people outside the community, especially to us, uh, the, the mission. We, we have a love-hate relationship with, uh, with the, uh, the Jewish community. Uh, we love them, they hate us. You know, uh, it, it's, 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 it's a wonderful, wonderful setup. Anyways, getting back to Isaiah 53, um, we, 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 uh, we see that there, there is a... Um, there's, there's this tension in, in sharing this with a Jewish person. Um, and and uh, that, that's, that's what, we, that's, you can, that's what we, that we go through when we're dealing with that. Now, Jews, they, they think that they, they know that they're missing something because they do read the Bible and they know they see all the sacrifices and they know that there's something, there's something missing. So you see, you see that there are Jews in Israel that are gathering everything that they need now to do what? To rebuild the temple. They, they're gonna, now, why do they need to rebuild the temple if you don't need a temple? If you don't need a temple, you don't need sacrifices, why are you rebuilding a temple? Because they're conflicted. They, they can read the Bible as well as you and I can. And, and, and so, 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 so Jews are struggling with this because 58% of the Mosaic law you cannot keep today. 58% of the Mosaic law you cannot keep today. Impossible. There's no temple, there's no sacrifice. That's, that's, what, that's, that's what's going on. So, uh, so sharing with, with, when, you, when you're sharing with a Jewish person, the best thing to do is, a, is establish a relationship, you know, with them, you know, and, and, uh, and just be, just being who you are, just being, just being the person that you are, be authentic, you know, and, and, and yet, and yet authentically love others. And we're, we're all called to reach other people, right? You know, some of the basics of that we, that we talk about reaching other people is what we do with Jewish, Jewish work, building relationships, being authentic, being who we are. Uh, being a friend, you know, uh, getting involved with uh, finding common ground, you know, like Israel. Israel is one that's a big common ground for Christians and Jews, right? We all, we all love Israel. We want Israel to be, to be safe and, and so forth. Jews and Christians share that together. So getting involved with things that, that will support the state of Israel. You know, even though the state's not perfect, I get that. You know, but in supporting the state of Israel is a big step you can take to, to reaching Jewish people. Um, and... Uh, and, you know, and, and it's, there's something that you have that Jewish people don't have. Anybody want, anybody want to guess what that might be? What? You have Jesus. <laughs> That's right. You, you, have, you have a relationship with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They don't. They think they do, but they don't. Jesus said, if you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father. Right? If you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father. And so, and so Jewish people who deny the Son do not have the Father. So you have a relationship as a believer in Jesus with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that is very enticing. In fact, Paul said that his, in his ministry to the Gentiles, his hope is that the Gentiles that he's influencing will provoke the Jewish people around them to jealousy that they'll see the reality of, of God in, in them and want that for themselves. Romans 11.11. 11. Every time you see the clock hit 11.11, 11, pray for the Jewish people. Think about Romans 11.11 11, and pray for the Jewish people that, 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 that they would come, that you would, provoke, you would provoke the Jewish people to jealousy. Uh, Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all people. The Lord is near. Your, your, your joy in the Lord uh, is a testimony to Jewish people that, that you have something that they don't have. And, and, then, and then Peter says at that point, and then be ready, and once you've provoked them through the joy and the peace you have in your life, 
Be ready to give a reason for the hope that's within you. Give that reason. At some point, say to them, I firmly believe that Jesus of Nazareth, who, is, uh, um, who the Jewish people call Yeshua, that's what we call him. We don't say Jesus, by the way, in Brooklyn. We say Yeshua. Uh, we don't say Christ. We say Messiah. We don't say church. We say congregation. All means the same thing, but th these are words that fall easily on Jewish ears. Uh, whereas Jesus, and, Jesus Christ, uh, to a Jewish person, it's like taking your fingernails and scratching a blackboard. That's what it feels like to a Jewish person. Anybody want to, anybody want to guess as to why that might be? About 2,000 years of, of so-called Christian anti-Semitism. Really bad stuff. Uh, uh, Dave and I were just talking about that. Even some of our heroes, like, like Martin Luther, you know, uh, were, uh, had, had said some terrible anti-Semitic things towards the end of his life. Uh, Jewish people, I mean, we, there, 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 is, there is some shameful things that happen in the church. Uh, and, 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 uh, and so, the, so one of the problems that we have to overcome is that. In fact, I was, I was, I was handing out um, tracts at a, at a subway stop at Sheep's Head Bay in Brooklyn, and this woman came up to me and goes, are you Jewish? And I, and I said, yeah. And, and, and she goes, if you lead one Jewish person uh, away from Judaism, you're going to hell. You know, and I said, I said, all I'm saying is that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, and that by believing in him, you can have the forgiveness of your sins and eternal life. And she goes, he's not the Messiah. And I said, why don't you think he's the Messiah? Now, I'm getting very excited now. She's actually talking to me. Most, people, most of the Jews won't talk to me. But she's talking to me, so I'm very excited. You know, and, and, and so she, and she goes, he's not the Messiah because of all the evil that has been done in his name to the Jewish people. I looked at her and I said, you're right. I said, I can't argue with you. I said, you're absolutely right. But that doesn't mean that he's evil and it doesn't mean he's not the Messiah. Just because people have done evil things in his name. And I, and, and, and I said, please, just take this and read it. She went, ah! You know, and she disappeared through the turnstile. Um... But that's, that's, the, that's the attitude. It's this big barrier in Jewish evangelism. And that's, and that's what we want to do. We want to, we're trying to break down that barrier. So what I, what I try to do, build relationships with people, get to the place where I can say to them, I'm, I'm firmly convinced that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah of Israel. That's how I identify him. The whole idea of Son of God, second person of the Trinity, that comes later. That comes later with discipleship. And I understand. I, we, we start with the Messiah of Israel. And, uh, and so... I, and so that, that's what I do. I say that to them, and then, then I just say, say to them, let me show you. And then I pull out a Bible, and I said, I'm going to read something from the, from the Bible to you, and uh, a passage from the Bible. Please tell me who you think the prophet is talking about. Just tell me who you think the prophet is talking about. Now, I don't usually tell them where I'm reading from, okay? I, I want that to be a surprise. So I just say, here, here, I said, uh, just tell me who you think the prophet is talking about. And I, and I said, and I, then I'll read the 53rd chapter of Isaiah as I read to you today. And I'll look at them and say, who is that? And nine times out of ten, they will say to me, oh, that's Jesus. And, and they'll assume that's from the New Testament. You know, and, and, and at that point I say, well, this is written by the prophet, the Jewish prophet Isaiah, 700 years before he was born. He gets very quiet in the room at that point. It gets, this is happening many times. It gets very quiet in the room at that point. The wheels are spinning. You know, uh, you know they, it, in fact, sometimes it gets quiet so long that, that I, I have to break, break the, the silence. But I don't want to. I want them to break the silence. You know, because it, it, it's, it's sinking in for the very first time that he could be the Messiah, like it did for me. And, and, uh, and so that's, what, that's what's going on in their minds. Now, my, I, I shared this with my uncle one time. He's... He sat on the, the board of his synagogue for 45 years. Um, and, uh, and so I, I, was, I, I, was, I, was at, I was in Atlanta uh, visiting uh, with them. And uh, I, was, I asked the Lord to show me what to do, and he showed me. And, and, I, and so the next morning at breakfast, I read, I said, I want to read something to you. And I read the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. And I said, who is that? And my uncle Elliot, 45 years on the, on the, on the board of his synagogue, you know, looked at me and said, that's Jesus. And I said, I said, Uncle Elliot, that was written by the prophet Isaiah 700 years before Jesus was born. And he immediately looked at me and goes, subject to interpretation. <laughs> now, you can't make, and what I'm trying to say is you can't make people believe. You know, once you plant, this is a seed. Once you've planted the seed, you have to trust that God, that, that the soil that it's in. It may be rocky soil. It may, it may be hard-packed may, may hard, hard soil. It may be rocky soil. It may be thorny soil or maybe good soil. But, but it's soil. You know, and, and, and all you're doing is planting the seed, right, uh, in that soil. 
you know, um, and, and, and if it is decent soil, if it is soil that, that, that the seed can grow in, then our job becomes to be gentle persuaders, to, to find out what their sticking point is and to help them through it, to shepherd them through it. There's going to be fear. For the Jewish person, there's going to be fear. Uh, they're they're going to be afraid of being ostracized from their community. You have to shepherd them through that. that, that, that's, that that's the job that we do as missionaries. We shepherd them through their fears, you know, uh, uh, because, because it's real. I had a woman say to me, she, she gave her life to the Lord at one of our services. At, 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 I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm the lead church planter for, Be, for Bessar Shalom uh, congregation in Brooklyn, the only English-speaking Messianic congregation. In fact, put, put up, the, um, put up the, uh, the, the thing there. What time do we close, by the way, the service? 12 o'clock? Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, well, I'll go to 12. Okay. So put up the, uh, the, the, the overhead. Okay, so this is uh, it's, it's called the Feinberg Center for Messianic Jewish Studies. Uh, and I am, uh, I, um, uh, it's, it, our job is to restore the Jewish gospel to the Jewish people of, of New York. Uh, it is a Jewish gospel. Jesus said, I came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, right? And, uh, and, so, and, so, and so it's a Jewish message to, a Jew, to the Jewish people. Remember when, when Philip uh, and Andrew came to Jesus and said, the Gentiles want to talk to you? Remember that? Uh, remember what Jesus said? My time's up. I'm going home, right? He said, then he starts talking about the seed dying and all that. He said, his time was up. He was going home. His mission was to Israel, was to the Jewish people. He left it up to the apostles to bring the gospel to the world, to the nations. Um, but uh, so, that, so that, that's our job. That's what we're, that's what we're trying to do uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, it, we took an old Jewish mortuary and converted it into a state-of-the-art mission center. Seven and a half million dollar project. Zero debt. No debt at all whatsoever. Totally paid for. Um, and uh, it, it, we just got into the center a couple of years ago. Uh, next, next slide. Uh, we, have, we have about, set, we have about a, a dozen programs now in place that we operate out of the Messianic Center uh, in Brooklyn. Next slide. Uh, we have uh, week, weekly services. Okay, I, I'm, I'm the lead church planter for the uh, Best Star Shalom Messianic Congregation. Um, I've been a pastor for 27 years. That's why they asked me to do it. Um, and and uh, so this is our congregation. It's called, uh, again, Best Star Shalom, uh, Brooklyn. Uh, that's our first bar mitzvah. That's Daniel, our, our first bar mitzvah boy. Uh, being bar mitzvah, that's me on the right, that's uh, my, my co my, one of my co-laborers, Joseph, on the left, uh, and that's our sanctuary to the left over there. Um, that, that's where we meet. Um, and and we, have, uh, we have a room for about 90 seats inside our, inside our sanctuary. Um, and uh, we, have, uh, we meet every, every Saturday morning at 10.30 in the morning. If you're ever in New York and you're there on a Saturday morning, come and visit with us, you know, at, 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 uh, at Beth Sar Shalom. Um, and then, uh, next slide. Oh, yeah, in the afternoon, we have, we have a Russian congregation that meets. It's called Gesher Hashemayim, or the Bridge to Heaven. And, uh, and so they, they meet, they meet on, uh, uh, at 3.30 in the afternoon. We meet at 10.30 in the morning. They meet at 3.30 in the afternoon. So we, the, the, the Holy Spirit blew through Brooklyn about 20 years ago and, and uh, led a lot of Russian Jews to, to Jesus during that time. So there's about four or five Russian Jewish congregations uh, in, in Brooklyn. But there's only one English-speaking congregation, and that's ours. Next one. Oh, that, okay. No, no, back, go back. We do, co we do uh, coffee houses. We'll invite Jewish, we'll invite Jewish um, uh, uh, artists who don't believe to, to, to perform. Now, why would we do that? Because they bring their Jewish friends with them. We get to meet them and, and build friendships and share the gospel with them. Uh, that, that's the idea. Next slide. Uh, we have all kinds of special events. We're, we're, a, we're a fully accredited theological seminary. Uh, we, we are, we're associated with Talbot Theological Seminary in, in La Mirada, California. When you graduate from our school, you get an MDiv. Uh, in a uh, master of divinity uh, in, um, uh, from Talbot. Uh, and so we have, we have concerts, we have lecture series, so we have, we have world-class scholars coming through and giving lecture series. We had the, uh, the curator for the Museum of the Scroll uh, in, from Jerusalem, Israel, uh, come, and speak, come and speak to us. His name is Adolfo Reutemann. Uh, and he, sp he spoke with us, and he is a top-notch uh, you know, uh, scholar uh, that came, came. He's actually a close friend of one of our, one of our vice presidents, who's a Harvard grad. Uh, he gra graduated Harvard with him. Um, we have uh, the uh, we, we show movies. We're doing a, a movie a movie series right now called called um, um, Covenant, Covenant and Controversy, uh, and it's a powerful movie the, a movie about about the about the the, um, the history of, of Jewish uh, of, of the Jewish community of, of anti-Semitism of the Messianic Jewish movement in uh, in uh, medieval Europe uh, and all the way up to the present day. Um, interesting series. Next. Uh, we have an internship program in the summertime. Our students leave uh, when the summer comes. They go to California to study uh, at, at our main campus in, in uh, La Mirada, California. 
And then we bring in interns to come and join us. And we train them to be in Jewish ministry and mission during the summertime. Uh, next. Uh, this is the uh, Shalom Brooklyn uh, street ministry. This is, I lead this ministry every summer. It's two weeks. We hit the streets with Christians from all over the world. Come and join us. About 100 Christians from all over the world will come. We hit the streets sharing the gospel with the Jewish people. Uh, if, if you love to share the gospel and you love the Jewish people, come and join us. There's still space available at Shalom Brooklyn uh, for, the, for this summer. July it is two weeks. You do one week at a time. Uh, you pick a week. Uh, uh, July, July 22nd through July 29th, and then July 29th through August 5th. Uh, there's two weeks that you can choose from if you're interested in sharing your faith. It, we, have, we have a blast. We have a, we have a wonderful time uh, doing that. People love coming to it. Uh, we do all kinds of fun things. Uh, next, next slide. Um, it just tells you what happened last year. Next slide. Uh, we have what we call soft opposition. Remember I said we have a love-hate relationship with the Jewish community. We love them. They hate us. You know, uh, so they, they tear down our signs. They smash our mezuzahs. You know, they threaten our lives. You know, things, things like that. But as, like, as long as they don't kill us, we're okay with that. You know, uh, it, it's, better to, it's better to have them angry with us than ignoring us. You know, and so we don't want to be ignored. So we, we kind of like it. It's like, it's like uh, someone said, though, we, we're living rent-free in their heads. You know, they're thinking about us. And um, so, we're, uh, so we get the soft opposition from them. We'll set up a book table, and then they'll, next slide, they'll put up a sign like this. They'll come around. Uh, these are Christians who are trying to steal your soul. Don't be fooled. Um, and uh, that's, that's a, by the way, in, 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 in Orthodox Jewish Brooklyn, calling someone a Christian is a slur. Just want to let, let, let you know. Maybe not here in uh, Owasso, Minnesota. Minnesota. Michigan. But in Brooklyn, New York, if you call someone a Christian, that's a slur. Um, and uh, so don't be fooled. So that, that's what they're, so they'll do that. There's actually organized opposition to us. Um, the, uh, it's a group of people called anti-missionaries. Uh, one of the groups is called Jews for Judaism. And, and they, they follow us around. They try to disrupt what we're doing. That's, that's their job. They, they, they flood our websites with, with uh, nonsense, trying to, trying to gum up our website. We're actually developing a new website now where they can't do that. Uh, so uh, it's very, what's happening in, with, on, online is amazing. Uh, next. Uh, so I've been to their meetings. I've actually been to anti-missionary meetings. You know, uh, they, they, open, they open one of them to the public. So I paid my $18. I went in and, and, uh, and, and I, I, we learned their strategies, you know, as to how they operate. Next. Um, this is where uh, amazing things are happening in Jewish ministry. Uh, it's it's uh, online ministry uh, or social media. Uh, it, it's, changing, it's changing the entire game. Uh, of, of Jewish ministry. Uh, usually, what we, sh we use Shalom Brooklyn to get Jewish contacts. You know, so, we, so we go, uh, no, for two weeks, we'll get 100 contacts uh, of Jewish people. For, and, that, that, and we're all excited. We've got 100 people to follow up now. You know, uh, you know invite them for, for coffee and share the gospel with them and all that stuff. So we're very excited about 100 people. It's amazing. So, so but social media, uh, we, a we advertise on Facebook to Jewish people. We drive them to our evangelistic websites or a platform at our websites. They, they, uh, we offer them free material in exchange for their contact information. We give, they, they, they send us their contact information. We, we send them the free material. We've done this in limited markets around the country, in, in uh, low population Jewish centers around the country. We have 4,000 Jewish names. Remember? We're happy with 100 from Shalom, Brooklyn. And now we have, we have 4,000 unbelieving Jewish people that have given us their contact information to follow up. We have 12,000 Gentiles. This is limited. This is like limited program. You know, we haven't even done New York yet. We had the, the big centers like New York and Miami and, and Los Angeles. We haven't even done those, those places yet. Okay? It's, we're, over, we're overwhelmed as it is with, with all the names that we're getting as a result of social media uh, and, and online ministry. It's a, now, this is especially important for Jewish ministry because Jews need anonymity to examine the claims of Jesus. They need to do it privately so no one's, when no one's watching. You can do online. You can do that, right? But so, so I know, I know there's some bad things online uh, with regard to that. But, but this is a good thing. The Jews have a chance to examine the claims of Jesus, you know, privately in their homes, you know, and and, uh, and we can follow up with them because we have their contact information. So it's a wonderful thing. And uh, pray, pray for the, pray for that new website that's coming out. It's going to be, it's going to transform everything. Uh, next, next, next slide. Um, so online ministries continue. Next slide. Um, future. So that's, that's the, the work, uh, some of the work that we're doing in Brooklyn. Um, you know, uh, again, I, I teach at the seminary. Um, I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm the chaplain of the school. I'm the dean of students. I'm the director of field education uh, at the school. Uh, and, and it's exciting work. Uh, we get to do all kinds of different things. 
Um, and, and it's exciting being part of, the, of, this, uh, of, of, a, Jew, of a Jewish mission. Um, the, uh, the, the, the work of, of, of Chosen People Ministries is, is around the world. We're in 17 different countries. Uh, we're, we're in, we're in uh, wherever there's a major Jewish population, that's where we are. Uh, and and uh, we have unique ministries to, to certain segments of the, of the Jewish world. For instance, when an Israeli soldier goes on tour, I mean, when it finishes his tour of duty, they go on tour themselves. They go, they do, do like a walkabout uh, around, you know, all over the globe. You know, one of the places they go to is New Zealand to go trekking in the mountains of New Zealand. Remember where, where uh, the, the um, Lord of the Rings was filmed way back in there? Well, they, they go back. We, they, we, have, we have a hostel on, on the edge of that. They can go there. We'll give the Israeli soldiers three free nights of, of, of living at, at our hostel uh, before they go trekking into, and they'll go, they go trekking with some of our guys into the, into the mountains, you know, uh, and, and they love it. And they'll talk about Jesus all day long with us because we're giving them this free, free, free days at, the, at this hostel. The hostel's big enough for like, seven, for like 70 people. Um, and, uh, and they love it. And so we're there. We're in New Zealand waiting for them. Uh, they, they go to ashrams in India searching Eastern religion. We have a house at the ashram. When we're sharing the gospel in a Jewish way with the Israeli soldiers when they get there. We have trekking companies in, in Argentina and now opening up in Brazil as well uh, because that's where they go and that's where we are. So wherever they go, we are because uh, we're a mission. We can do that. that, that, that we're, we're very flexible and able, able to do things like that. So again, we have about 150 missionaries, about 250 staff altogether uh, around the world. Um, and, um, and, and, and we're a... Um, and there's all kinds of, there's all kinds of uh, things you can do. There's, there's a mission trip to Israel. You can take your young people, I think the 18 and 30, I think, or 35, they can go to Israel for five or six weeks and do mission, mission work uh, in Israel. Uh, and that, that's exciting. Uh, I'm actually leading a, a, a trip to Israel uh, in o o the end of October, early November. Uh, it, it's, just, it's just like a pilgrimage to Israel. Uh, it's, I call it uh, seeing Israel through Messianic Jewish eyes. We have, a mess we have two, uh, two Messianic Jewish leaders and a Messianic Jewish tour guide taking us through the, all, all the sites in Israel. If you've never seen Israel before, this is a great trip to go on, uh, to see Israel. So it's at the end of October, October 30th through like uh, November 8th uh, for that. Um, and if you're, interested in that, if you're interested in that, I'll tell you how, you can, how, you, how I can help you with that. Anyways, everybody get one of these? Everybody get one of these? You should, everybody should have one of these. So they're, they're on the, can someone grab them from the back table and gift to anybody who doesn't have one? Um, I was hoping that they would be distributed with the... Uh, um, the uh, bulletins, yeah. So just raise your hand if you, don't, if you don't have one of these. Yeah. Oh, you got one. Great. Okay. There you go. All right, so, so if you could hold it up like this, we have, we have a tradition at Chosen People Ministry, it's called the tearing of the brochure. It was started back in 1894 by Rabbi Leopold Cohen. Just kidding. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's, you, you hold up, everybody hold up like this, and uh, we're, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna tear the brochure together on three. We're gonna count to three. In fact, I'm gonna teach you Hebrew. You wanna learn some Hebrew? Okay, uh, we're gonna count to three in Hebrew. Okay, now the, the and, and then uh, the, me, the word for one is achat. Achat. Can you say achat? Achat, okay. The word for two is shatayim. Shatayim. Achat, shatayim. Okay, and the third word is easy. Shalosh. Shalosh. Achat, shatayim, shalosh. So on, when, we, when we say that together, we're going to tear the brochure at the exact same time. We want to make one sound. Okay, synchronization is critical here. You ready? Okay, so, ready? I'll, I'm going to go like this. I'm going to go, Achat, Shatayim, Shalosh. Okay? Here we go. Here we go. You ready? Achat, Shatayim, Shalosh. Oh, not bad. That was one of the best it's ever done. That was amazing. Except over here. <laughs> we had one straggler over here. But that was amazing. That was absolutely amazing. Uh, anyways, on, on, on this side... Uh, it has a get, how to get involved with us through our mission trips, you know, uh, and uh, all, all kinds of... The, we, have a, we have a volunteer program with the VIP program where you can, where, where you can help us with those 4,000 names that we have from your, from, from, your own kitchen, from your own kitchen counter, 
Uh, you, you make telephone calls to these folks, and, the, and, the, and then we set up appointments uh, with them so we can go meet with them. So we need help in, in, in reaching these folks. So it's called the Volunteer in Place Program, VIP. And you can get involved in that. You can check off there. If you have a Jewish uh, neighbor, friend, coworker, uh, maybe a Jewish professional in your life, give us, their, give us their contact information, and we will send them loving, sensitive, Jewish-appropriate gospel material. Uh, if, if they don't want it, they can just check off, please don't send it to me anymore, and we won't. Uh, we won't tell them who gave us the name, but if you want to, you can tell them yourself. Um, and so give us that. On the other side uh, is, a, is a way of, of getting involved with us, uh, and the and, uh, most important way for me would be, I'd love to have you guys on, on my, uh, my prayer letter. Um, I, the, I, I send a prayer letter out every month. I'd love to have you guys getting my prayer letter and, uh, and seeing what we're doing in Brooklyn and what's, what's happening, and you'd be praying for for the work that's going on in Brooklyn. If you fill this out uh, and check off, just check off, please send me the newsletter, then I'll, I'll, send, I'll send you my prayer letter and, and uh, you can find out what's going on. We can stay in touch with one another. Um, also, there's a way of giving here as well. Uh, and, uh, and, and I'm a support raising missionary uh, and a faith, faith missionary and, and uh, raising funds. I'm about 60% right now uh, in, in, my, in my support raise. I've got, they, they brought me on uh, you know, uh, and gave me a certain amount of time to get my, to get my support raised. So, I, I'm, so my, my time is winding down. So I, I, I'm looking for people who want to come on board and, and be a regular supporter uh, for, for me and uh, Michelle, my, my wife. I didn't introduce my wife, did I? Uh, my wife is Michelle of 36 years. We've got three grown boys. And I'll tell you about that in a second. Um, but anyways, uh, so, so again, it, it, so just fill this out. You can, you can give by cash, uh, by check, by credit card. You can give your firstborn male child. We'll take anything. Um, and and, and uh, just... just, just just, that was a joke. Thank you for laughing. I appreciate it. Um, so, uh, so, so then you just fill that. If, if you give cash, if you, want, if you want to give a gift today, there are offering plates in the back. Just drop, just drop this in the offering in, uh, plate in the back if you want to give today. Um, and, and just put down, if you're giving cash, put down how much cash you're giving on this, and we'll receipt you from, uh, from uh, Chosen People Ministries. Thank you so much for, uh, for, for having us and, uh, and being part of what you're doing here uh, in uh, Owasso. Um, I want to finish up uh, with, with the, uh, Isaiah 53 before we close. Um, the, we work in Orthodox Jewish Brooklyn, and, uh, and it's a different animal than, than, than with secular Jews. Uh, and and they, they have their own interpretation of the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. And what they say is, they say that the, that the 53rd chapter of Isaiah uh, is, this is a Jewish interpretation, uh, it, it started by a guy named Rashi, a rabbi named Rashi, uh, in the, at, the, at the 11th century in the 11th century AD. Uh, and, and what he said was, is that the voice you hear, the one speaking, is the voice of the Gentile nations bemoaning how they treated Israel. So it's the Gentile nations repenting for their, their terrible treatment of Israel. And that's the voice you hear. Okay, and, and that's, so when we read Isaiah 53, we say, oh no, this is the voice of God through the prophet Isaiah, you know, uh, and the prophet Isaiah representing the Jewish people, right? That's what it sounds like. It sounds like God speaking to the prophet, you know, and the prophet is sort of representative of Israel. Okay, and that's the natural way of understanding it. When you read it and you listen to it, that's the way, that's the way you'll naturally hear it. But the rabbis say, oh no, you're reading it wrong. All right, the voice you hear is the Gentile nations bemoaning their bad treatment of, of, of the Jewish people of Israel. Now, what do we say to that? How do we answer that? Well, there's two... Crit two critical, two critical things. Okay, first is the uh, 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 verse eight. It says, "My people." In the in the in the original text, it says, "My people." Um, let, me, let me let me read that to you. Um, God is speaking. Verse eight. Because of the oppression and judgment, he was taken away. As for his generation, who considered, for he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, the stroke was theirs. Now, there is no place in the Bible, in all of the Old Testament, where my people refers to Gentiles. No place whatsoever, ever, ever, ever. Okay, it's, 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 the, it's, it's the Jewish people who, are, who God calls his people, and then the nations, uh, and the Gentiles. That's, that, that, is, that is how it is done. So here, right in this passage, uh, God is calling the, the, uh, the, the, the people who are, who are at fault, he's calling them my people. 
Okay, so that, that's first of all. Secondly, in verse 10, look at verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, to cause him to suffer, and he makes his soul a guilt offering. He will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of Adonai will succeed in his hand. Okay, so, so in verse 10, we see that... Uh, let me see. The, uh, the, okay, no, verse, verse 11, I'm sorry. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied by his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, will make many righteous, but he will bear their inequities. He is the, the servant who the Jews say are Israel, uh, who we say is Jesus, you know, is, is the servant, you know, is called righteous. Israel is not righteous. In fact, that's been, that was Israel's big problem. They kept failing, right? They, they, they failed uh, in, in the first temple period. And what happened to them? Anybody remember? Yeah, they, got, they got sent to Babylon. They, got, they, they, had, they were exiled for 70 years in the Babylonian captivity. They, not because they were righteous. <laughs> It's because they were unrighteous, they were idolaters. Then, then they came back from Babylonian captivity, reestablished in the land, and, and they are never called righteous at that time as well. In fact, if you read, if you read uh, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, they were, they were very angry with the Jewish people. You know, they were intermarrying, they were doing all kinds, of all kinds of breaking, they were breaking the law. God does not refer to the Jewish people as being righteous unless it's about the future Israel in the eschaton, the future Israel in the, in the last days. Then there's a couple of references to, to, the, to a future Israel who, redeemed by the Lord who will be looked at as being righteous. It's sort of a future hope kind of a thing. Uh, so that's it. So in fact, if you go to Isaiah chapter 59, the first 15 uh, verses are all about how unrighteous Israel is, how terrible, how sinful they are, how deceitful they are. It says in, it says in Isaiah 53 that the serpent has no deceit in his mouth. Yet... yet, yet Yet it says, uh, yet, yet they, they say that it's Israel, that the Jewish people say that this is Israel that they're talking about. Well, Israel has lots of deceit according to Isaiah 59, 1 through 15. So, so the bottom line is what I'm trying to say is, is that this is what we deal with. This is, how, this is, this is, this is the context where we're ministering in, you know, and, and, uh, and, and the battles, the, some of the battlefields that we, that we have in our work. Um, thank you very much for, for, for listening. I'm going to close in a word of prayer, and, uh, and then I'll let, let uh, Dave take over. Father, thank you for uh, this opportunity, this time that we could uh, share together, Lord, and in your word and understanding a little better, uh, Father, about your, your word and how it applies to our lives. Uh, I pray for these folks, Lord. Thank you for their willingness, Lord, to, to uh, be here, Lord, and to hear about the, the work of Jewish ministry. I pray, Lord God, that you would move in their hearts to partner with us in any way they can, Lord, to be part of what we're doing uh, in, in Brooklyn and around the world. And I, I thank you for this opportunity, and I pray all this in Yeshua's name. Amen. I'll be back at the book table uh, if you want to talk or, uh, or just look over the books. Please stand and join us as we sing our closing song. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. You may be dismissed.